So with that, let me just uh, quickly state Lorentz transformation and um, its uh, relationship to space-time diagrams. So, um, so this is how I like to always specify Lorentz transformation. I kind of want to do it in terms of two relatively newly defined variables. One of them is beta. It's uh, um, speed in the unit of uh, speed of light, V over C. So it's a beta is a unitless quantity and um, it's useful because, well, because it's uh, <laughs> it makes some of the formulas simpler. I think that's the most useful way in which it shows. In fact, the very first formula it simplifies is the Lorentz factor gamma, which you have seen last week. Uh, gamma is in terms of beta, it can be written as one over square root of one minus beta squared. And the value of gamma also is that it simplifies some of the formulas. So when you write down Lorentz transformation, which is a rule that tells us how to express the, um, or how to figure out what the, the coordinates in the primed coordinate system are, and as a quick description of what this priming means, you have to imagine um, two inertial reference frames. One inertial reference frame that is at uh, rest. You might call this quote unquote lab frame. This is, the, this is what you maybe think of as rest frame. And you can think of a second inertial reference frame. It's inertial in that it's not accelerating. It's moving at some constant speed. And this other inertial reference frame could be defined by a vehicle or something that's moving at some speed beta c relative to the lab frame. And this would be our primed coordinate system. And we are imagining, okay, let's take a point here. And that point can be described in terms of the uh, time and space coordinates in the lab frame. It would have a time coordinate in the lab frame and it would have some kind of space coordinate. And this same point here can be represented in the time and the space coordinate that refer to this uh, moving inertial reference frame. So that's what Lorentz transformation describes. It, all, it tells you how to get these primed frame coordinates if you know the unprimed frame coordinates. Let me write that down. So, um, so Y and Z are the simplest. They don't change at all. Y prime is just Y. G prime is just a G. Um, so this is where this is moving in the plus X direction. And the, how the X prime coordinate transforms, it actually makes a lot of sense if you connect it to how Galilean transformation would look like. Uh, so actually the Galilean transformation would look like X minus beta CT, beta C being the speed at which this frame moves and T is the amount of time. The only real difference between Galilean transformation and Lorentz transformation is this presence of factor gamma, or you know, if you're putting this into divided by square root of one minus beta squared. But we define this factor gamma so that our expressions will be simpler. And it turns out it has a lot of uses, so we'll keep it. The hardest is really the, the time coordinate. And this is the one that I don't really want to <laughs> have to drive. So I'll just state what it is and point out the uh, the point out the symmetry between the transformation of the space coordinate with the time coordinate. So the time coordinate transforms this way. Um, there's still this gamma factor here and there's the time portion CT. And then it has a second term that you never would have expected from Galilean or Newtonian physics. Uh, there's a minus beta X. Sometimes we say in Lorentz transformation, the time and space coordinates mix, as in it, space coordinates 
come into determining some of the time coordinates under this transformation. So, so that's a Lorentz transformation. It's uh, something that you are going to be seeing a lot in the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. Okay, and uh, so that um, uh, so this is a short, really uh, abbreviated version of the introduction. We do have a longer intro in the uh, other like recorded lectures. Now, um, Lorentz transformation is algebraic, and um, there's an aspect of it that's uh, kind of difficult to gain understanding of quickly. One especially is the relativity of simultaneity. And um, Lorentz transformation actually includes that. This uh, line here, actually, if you think through it carefully, it tells you right away that simultaneity is not relative because a set of points that have t is equal to zero do not necessarily have the same property that t prime is equal to zero because of this space component getting mixed in. So, um, so Lorentz transformation already includes those important concepts, but it doesn't make it uh, manifestly evident. So the tool, the graphical tool that I like to use, which frankly for me was revolutionary in helping me understand special relativity is what we call space-time diagram. And I was showing earlier the 15 minute video uh, covering introduction of space-time diagram and demonstrating some of its uses. So here I will just uh, limit to drawing what it looks like and what it illustrates. So what it looks like, it looks like a kind of an XY graph. The only thing that's different is uh, what the axis represents. In an XY graph, the you know X represents a horizontal axis, Y represents a vertical axis. What more is there? Uh, with the space-time diagram, the horizontal axis traditionally represents X, one of the dimensions of a space position, and the the vertical axis or the vertical-ish axis represents time, CT. And the most important thing that space-time, so this is a kind of a, um, a blank canvas where you can represent motion of a particle, for example. You can plot uh, as a function of time, its position at all times. It's one of the things you can do. And what this ends up being very useful for is for illustrating Lorentz transformation. So, um, so, so in this uh, picture here, let me draw the axis that represents the axis for the space-time coordinate of the S prime frame. Um, I think before I draw that, it'll be useful for me to draw this particular line, which um, you could call uh, light world line. It's a, a trajectory of light in space time. It has slope one because of the way we are plotting the y and the x axis. And uh, this is useful for as a kind of a reference line. So um, if you imagine this uh, uh, container is moving at an appreciable fraction of speed of light, let's say, I don't know, 20% of speed of light, then this is what the space-time axis uh, within that frame would look like. This is gonna be the CT prime axis. And this is gonna be the X prime axis. And I think a CT prime axis is easy to understand. It's the set of points where X is equal to zero, or sorry, X prime is equal to zero. So it's, a, let's say, uh, whichever point within the vehicle you said is X prime equals zero, um, this is showing how that point moves in the reference frame of the, the lab frame. That uh, kind of, we had something similar in Galilean relativity. I think this is pretty easy for us to comprehend what takes a lot of intuition building is this axis, the X prime axis. 
what does it mean? How does it relate to other things? And what uh, graphically, what this x prime x is out to mean is this. These are set of points where ct prime is equal to zero. They all have the same value of ct prime. And in fact, uh, in the lecture for space time diagram, that's what I do, you know, set ct prime here equal to zero and then drive on expression for line. And what this means is that this is what someone might call line of simultaneity. These are the set of points that represent everything in the reference frame as prime that would be happening at t prime equals zero. So, so this uh, illustration alone shows that uh, what's considered to be simultaneous in the s prime frame is different from what's considered to be simultaneous in s frame. So in, uh, in this drawing, the simultaneity in S frame looks like a horizontal line and any other horizontal line would connect to two simultaneous events. Now, in the S prime frame, this is what defines things that are simultaneous. So two events, for example, one here, one here, that were simultaneous in the lab frame, they are not simultaneous in the S prime frame. In fact, this happens earlier. The time coordinate for this is less than zero. And, um, and any other line of simultaneity, if you draw it, it would be parallel to this, um, the CT prime is equal to a zero line. So th this is the point where CT, it's later than what you have at the origin. This is the line that represents points that were earlier before the origin. So that's the quick, as quick as I can make it, a quick introduction to Lorentz transformation and space-time diagram. And what this is useful for is for analyzing situations that um, when you hear the description of, seems quite unintuitive, maybe even self-contradictory. And that's where the description paradox comes from. And I want to caution you that uh, when we say special relativity paradox, it's not really paradox in the mathematical sense. That's why I keep putting the scare quotes because um, this is what I like to say. The special relativity has no paradoxes, just uh, situations that are uh, difficult to understand at first. But once you understand it, it's all logically consistent. There's no contradiction anywhere. This is not like a Russell's paradox or, oh, I don't know any other paradoxes. You know, there are parad genuine paradoxes in mathematics where two things actually uh, contradict each other. Like, uh, what is it, a liar's paradox? Um, a statement like, uh, this statement is a lie is a self-contradicting paradox because if the statement, this statement is a lie, is true, then, um, then, then the statement should be a lie. But, um, uh, and if, if it is a lie, then which means it's a true statement, so it's not a lie. That's what a real logical paradox is. And the special relativity paradoxes, they are more of a confusing situation where without a, intuition for special relativity, you would think there's a, something that's self-contradictory, but once you learn to understand it, then there's nothing paradoxical about it. So as I was saying before we got into this, um, um, I do cover uh, some of these paradoxes already in the available lecture. And I think one of the classic paradoxes that I haven't covered is something called a pole in a barn paradox. Wonder if your textbook does. I probably should have checked if it does. <laughs> if it does, then I will um, do it in the uh, context of the text, what textbook already does, pole in the barn paradox. Let me just put in the word barn. No, so your textbook might not. So, 
So let me just do that. Uh, this is a fun um, paradox situation to think about. And even though the phrase uh, pole in the barn paradox is a common name for this paradox, let me just demonstrate that with a Google search, pole in the barn paradox. Um, I'm gonna give a, or I guess ladder paradox. Uh, I'm gonna use a slightly different situation because uh, we have been using the setup of a train and train station already. So, so let me just continue using that. So um, I will call this um, train in train station or train in station paradox. And I'll put quotation around the paradox just to emphasize that it's not real paradox. It's just uh, something that you need to understand. Once you understand it, there's nothing paradoxical about it. And um, I guess I can state this uh, particular paradox in this way. Um, let me give you some concrete length so that we are not dealing with um, abstract. So let's say we have a train of length. Um, let's make the length easy for me. Uh, I'm going to say it has a length of uh, 10 meters. You know, let's say whenever we specify length, we mean proper length. So I won't have to specify that it's a train's proper length. I'll just say that it's a train's length. And by saying that it's train's length, it's understood that this number just, uh, it's measured in the train's rest frame. So it's a proper length. So I have a 10 meter long train. It's a fairly Wow, it is a really short train. It's a fairly short train <laughs> um, that's moving at some relativistic speed. Let me make this relativistic speed easy for me. I am going to say it. Uh, um, one, I'm remembering uh, 0 0.866c. I think that uh, it's supposed to be a fraction if it's meant to be exact. I'll just leave it here, uh, but I have a relativistic uh, speed um, train that's uh, moving at that speed. And it's uh, approaching a train station. And I want to see if this uh, train will fit between two gates of the train station. So this train is coming towards the train station. Um, and let's see, how long do I want to make the gate? Let, let me make this easy at first. So I'll say the, that the two gates at the station are set up so that they will close at the same time. And uh, they are separated by uh, 10 meters apart. So the length between the gate is uh, 10 meters. So the question is, so um, between the train, between the train conductor and the station chief, they are trying to arrange all this so that um, as the train passes by, they're gonna close the gate. And then I guess you have to open the gates again, otherwise the train's gonna just bust through the <laughs> one of the gates. <laughs> so, but uh, the goal here is to just to close the gate, um, measure the length of the train or do something meaningful <laughs> and then open it again. Um, and as you are doing this, you have a disagreement between Alice, the train operator, and Bob, the station chief. Bob claims that there's a plenty of space here. The train, which is a moving ruler, is a short. It's a Lorentz contracted. So Bob says that as the train passes by, he's going to be able to fit the train actually well within the length of the uh, length between the gates. Um, I think if I worked out the Lorentz uh, contraction factor right, this uh, Lorentz contracted length will actually be about five meters. So um, that's what Bob claims that he'll be able to do. But from Alice's perspective, it looks different because from Alice's perspective, it looks like the station is approaching towards her train. And from her perspective, these gates will be contracted. So these gates won't quite uh, be separated enough to be able to contain our train. So, so that's the paradox. Who is right? Is the train able to fit between the two gates 
or is it not? <laughs> Shouldn't it be one or the other? Um, so, so that's the paradox. And um, I think this is the paradox that's uh, harder to resolve than the twin paradox, because at least with the twin paradox, a lot of people get a sense of uh, some kind of closure, you know, an answer that one twin gets older and the, the younger twin is younger because that younger traveling twin is changing reference frames. And in this paradox, you don't even have that. You just have two reference frames moving relative to each other. And it, the statement sounds so reasonable, you know, train either fits or it doesn't fit. <laughs> so which is it? Um, this is the kind of paradox that I felt really I understood once I learned to analyze it using space-time diagram. So let me give you a description of this setup with space-time diagram. So let me draw a space-time diagram axis here to illustrate this paradox with. And I'm drawing it so that I have more space on the plus side of both uh, CT and X. And I feel like it'll be useful for me to have a light uh, world line reference just so that I know how to angle my other stuff. All right, um, uh, let's say this unprimed coordinate, this is the station. And uh, we'll draw as necessary the, the axis for the train. Um, uh, I guess in fact, I might as well do it now. So drawing it, so uh, I've done the introduction of how to draw this axis in the space-time diagram lecture, 25 minute lecture, I'll just do it here. Um, so my CT prime axis, uh, which we, I can define my coordinate axis so that it matches up with one of the ends of the train. Um, let me make the back of the train uh, match up with the, the, the back of the train. Let me make that match up with X prime equals zero. That'll make the world line of the back of the train match up with the CT prime axis that I need to draw. So I'm not quite drawing it to scale because I think if we equal 0 0.866 is rather extreme value, but this should be close to CT prime. And the slope for this, if I drew it properly, the slope should be uh, one over beta. That's how it should be. Um, and the, the X prime axis, that's the axis defined by setting uh, CT prime equal to zero. Uh, or in the Lorentz transformation, that should look something like this. And as your textbook was describing, when done properly, this angle here is same as this angle. Um, it kind of you know scissors in <laughs> to how the Lorentz transformation axis looks like. So, so that's uh, uh, the reference frame of the train. Um, and, oh, and the slope of this. If you draw it correctly, it should look like a beta. That's what the slope here looks like. Okay, um, so space-time diagram axis that sets the uh, setting, the stage, and what it is for stage four is I need to um, now draw the world lines of the object. Um, so I think I've already drawn the world line of the back of the train. So let me draw the world line of the front of the train. So let's say from here to somewhere around here, that's uh, 10 meters in the X prime axis. So, uh, so the, my front of the train here is going to at least have a point here. And the front of the train moves at the same speed that the back of the train does. So if I draw the world line, the trajectory of the front of the train, it's going to have a slope that's the same as my back of the train. If I'm drawing this right line right, these two should look kind of parallel. All right, that, that seems good enough. So this is the front of the train and this would be the back of the train. And let me try to set up my coordinate axis so that, um, so that we are trying to close the gate when the uh, 
when the back of the train aligns with the with the uh, behind the, the the left side gate. So that's where our uh, t is equal to zero will be. And at t equals zero, that's when the back of the gate is right at that, or back of the train is right at the gate. And um, the front of the gate, it should be, let's see here. So I'm just eyeballing the, the scale. I think uh, the scale should be around here, should be the 10 meter length for the um, 10 meter length in the station frame. So let me uh, draw the world lines of these gates. So the back gate, the left -hand side gate here, it's gonna be at x equals zero and it's just gonna stay there for all time. It's, it, it basically, the world line for this basically goes along the CT axis, kinda boring. It's just a vertical line uh, maintaining the same X value forever. And actually the same thing for the right side gate. Um, yeah, let me just keep using red. So the right side gate is at 10 meter position, stays there forever. So it's gonna look uh, something like, yeah, yeah, I think it, again, I'm kind of eyeballing it. So I'm not doing the scale 100% right. I think I've actually drawn it a little bit too far to the right. It should have been a little bit further to the left. So, okay, uh, I, I think I have illustrated everything. Now that I have drawn everything, I think I can now, I'm now in the position to explain this uh, training station paradox. Uh, let me first uh, uh, describe the Bob, the station chips perspective. So Bob, the station chief, closes the gate at t equals zero. So at t equals zero, he closes the gate. So the event, uh, the space-time coordinate at which he closed the gate, they can be represented by these two points. This point here, the back of the left-hand gate at t equals zero, and this point here, the right-hand gate at t equals zero. And what he finds the train to be doing at that time is he finds that the train is occupying this space here at t equals zero. So he says, oh yeah, the train has Lorentz contracted, it fits, fits well within between my gates. From Alice, the uh, train conductor's perspective, this is what Alice says. You have to understand that Alice does not see these two events as being simultaneous in her reference frame. In fact, this is a line of a simultaneity that describes the set of points that are simultaneous in her reference frame at t prime equal to zero. Uh, there is another line of simultaneity that goes through this point, but you know, it would have to be parallel to the x prime axis. And this is some distance below the x prime uh, coordinate. So there is a value of ct prime that's associated with this. It's something less than zero. It happens at some time before this point does. So from Alice's perspective, this is what it looks like. As her train passes by, she sees that the station chief closed the, the right gate first and then opened it. And then at some later time, as the back of her train was going through the right gate, that's when it closes the right gate and then opens again. So from Alice's perspective, the train never fit between these two gates um, closing and opening because um, one gate closed and opened well before um, at one point in time, at this point in time, and the other gate closed and opened at a much later point in time.
from Alice's perspective, um, at the space-time coordinates that are simultaneous to her, if we sure to mark some spots, I don't know, maybe drop a bag or something, then she would be marking these two points as being uh, simultaneous in her reference frame. So this is back of the train, that's fine. That occurs at the same time as the gate closing and opening. And this is the front of, front of her train at t prime equals zero. And that, that at t prime equals zero, she's seeing this, um, this gate is already, um, you know, it's Lorentz contracted. So the front of the train is already past the right side of the gate, right gate. So um, so at the t prime equals zero, that um, um, Alice doesn't see that the, the train fits into the station. And, and if we were to try to do something to mark these positions, uh, I was saying, you know, okay, maybe Alice can drop a bag as she's uh, uh, passing by the station. So she drops a bag at x equals zero and she drops a bag here. And from Bob's perspective, what this would look like is Alice would drop a bag at the back of her train as that passes through the right gate but she doesn't drop her front back at the same time. She actually waits until a later time when the front of the train has passed the, through the gate and then drops her back. So from Bob's perspective, Alice cheated because she didn't drop the bags at the same time. But, so this is where relativity of simultaneity matters. When we say at the same time, it really should have either quotation mark or we should specify at the same time in what reference frame. The space-time diagram clearly shows um, in what reference frame it is at the same time in. Um, so anything that's uh, occurring at the same time in the station reference frame would be connected by horizontal line. Anything that's happening at the same time in the train's reference frame would be connected by a line that has a slope of beta. So, so that's the explanation of one of the paradoxes, uh, the training station paradox um, using space-time diagram.